Welcome to the Rising Woman Leaders Podcast. We are a sisterhood of women stepping into courage, self-love, and feminine leadership. I'm your host, Meredith Rahm, and here I'll be sharing personal insights as well as interviews with inspiring leaders and entrepreneurs so you can create more daily magic in your life and also grow your business without losing sight of spiritual values as a rising woman leader. If you like this podcast, use our hashtag Rising Woman Leaders, follow me on Instagram at Meredith Rom, and sign up for email updates at risingwomanleaders.com. You'll receive all the new and inspiring content, including insights I only share on email. Now get cozy with a cup of tea, light a candle, and grab a journal to listen to this week's magical radio podcast. Hey everyone, it's Meredith. I am so excited to share the interview with Katie Dalebout today. She is a fellow author and podcast host and has some wonderful wisdom to share. Um, But before we dive in, I wanted to let you know that I announced a Kickstarter campaign to raise funds for the printing of my book, Synchronicity. The time I'm recording this, it's only been out for three days and we're almost at 50% of the goal. I'm so grateful for all of you who have contributed. And if you want to take a moment and check that out, I'll put the link in the show notes. And you can also just visit meredithrom.com. And at the top, you'll see a link to check out the page. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy today's show. Welcome back. This is Meredith Rahm, and I am excited to have Katie Dalebout on the show today. A little bit about Katie. She's a millennial blogger, a yoga teacher, and a podcast host. She explores creativity as a gateway to developing a positive positive body image, and true holistic wellness. Her first book, which I've been reading, it was published with Hay House just this spring as a collection of journaling tools to help people find self-acceptance beyond their physicality. Katie's also the host of Let It Out podcast, formerly known as the Wellness Wonderland Radio, which is how I first heard about Katie, and it was a huge inspiration for me to start this podcast for Rising Woman Leaders. So welcome, Katie. So happy to have you here. (laughs) So happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me, Meredith. And I'm so happy and grateful that it was able to inspire you to do the podcast because I love podcasts. So that's amazing. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. And I've been the last couple of weeks, just I got your book and been reading it, let it out. And I'm finding that more than being like journaling tools, there are some amazing stories and spiritual wisdom throughout it. And I wanted to tell you that I was sitting and having a haircut when I first read the story about how the book came to be and how it came to be published. And I was just kind of freaking out at what a miracle story it was. Mm. And I was telling my hairdresser and I left that day and I was telling oh. everyone I ran into. <laughs> and oh my it, gosh, that is so cool. <laughs> Hopefully they go get the book too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they really, it. there was something to it of just like, when I hear of and read of other people's miracle stories, it just so, it, it lights me up and makes me feel like so much is possible for my own life. And it I would, is. <laughs> yeah. I would love to share with whoever's listening just that story of how this book came to be, this dream that you had. You had no idea how it was going to happen. And, and then you found out about this workshop. And I'd love if you would just tell the story from there. Oh, gosh, I wish you would tell it. You'd probably do a better (laughs) job. Um, I'll tell, like, a short version because it can be a very long story. But if people want the the unabridged version, they can – it's in the book. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's funny because it was actually in the afterword of the book. And my editor was the one who was like, that's a pretty good story. And a lot of people might not read the afterword, so – let's move it to the introduction because I think we should kick it off that way. And so I did, and I'm glad I did because a lot of people, like you said, just thought that story was pretty relevant and interesting. So what happened, What and it's like a big spoiler alert because you 
it would have been a better story if you didn't know that the book ended up coming out, which you kind of know <laughs> at this point. But what happened was I, in college, knew I wanted to, at the very end of college, knew I wanted to write a book. My mentor, Gabrielle Bernstein, was like a huge um, inspiration to me. And, and she had written maybe just one book at the time. But I, it kind of planted the seed that I wanted to write a book about something. And it was, you know, just something I had wanted to do on the back of my mind. And I had an idea about what I wanted to write about then, which is not the book that I wrote, but I had like this idea and I didn't know how it was going to happen or how I was going to do it. And then several, several months later, maybe like a year later, I was listening to Hay House Radio, which is like a satellite radio station. And there was an ad for a conference in New York, a writer's workshop that my mentor, Gabrielle Bernstein, was speaking at, as well as Chris Carr and a few other people. And I loved Chris Carr and I loved Gabby and I wanted to go hear them speak. And so I was like, I'm going to go to this. I ended up like getting the workshop for my birthday for my mom. And it was also, they were going to be talking about book writing and publishing. And so I was like, cool, this is amazing. I'll go, whatever. So I go to this thing. When I get there, I find out that there's actually a contest associated with it too, where if you go, they'll teach you how to write a book proposal. And then you have like nine months, maybe more to write the proposal and submit it to Hay House. And they will give book deals. They'll give one book deal. And then to the second prize and the third prize is like a self publishing deal and like another self thing. I don't remember what the third prize was anyway. So I didn't know that at the time. And you had like nine months, you'd learn how to write the book proposal, which is kind of like an, it's like a intensive thing. It kind of takes nine months cause you have to do a competitive analysis and you have to like talk about like a marketing and promotion strategy for your book and you have to write, you know, an abstract of every chapter and then you have to do a full sample chapter and then as well as like many other parts. It's like something that would, would take nine months, you know? Um, anyway, so I go home from this, this workshop. I had a great time. I learned how to write the proposal. Great to see my mentor speak. Really nice time come home and I don't have an idea for a book because the one I wanted to do in college just wasn't exciting to me anymore. It wasn't something that felt interesting to me anymore. And so I didn't have an idea. And so I didn't write, I didn't work on the proposal for many, many months for all of the months actually. And then I decided that summer I wasn't going to submit a proposal to the contest, which I had been really excited about the contest and I really wanted to for a long time. But for whatever reason, I just decided it wasn't a fit for me anymore and I wasn't going to do it because I didn't have an idea. And I was kind of bummed, but I was just like, whatever. And like, I remember like going into my mom's um, office when I was home visiting and being like, oh, you know, the thing you got me for my birthday, like, I'm not actually doing that. And she was like, oh, it's okay. Like, you know, focus on your job. Don't worry about like, don't worry about that. And I was like, phew. Okay, cool. So I forgot about it, whatever. And then like the new year came and went and I still kind of in the back of my mind, I was a little bit bummed that I wasn't going to be submitting to this contest. And I finally one morning woke up and there was only a week left to go before the deadline. And I had an idea I like did a meditation and I like got done with the meditation. I was journaling and the idea came to me while I was journaling. I was like, I'll write a book about journaling. And very quickly I was writing on a legal pad. All of the chapters just like came to me. All of the, I was like, I'm going to write it. Journaling has been so impactful for me that I'm going to write a book about it. And I'm going to write tool, journaling prompts and journaling tools about how to get organized, how to get over your, fears and actually feel your feelings and develop more self-awareness and I had like all these chapters and it just like came very quickly I wrote the outline for the book and then I I like stood up and I was like oh I really want to submit this so I could actually get a book deal but it's too late like it literally was too late like I had a week and I had done none of that big project you know mm -hmm. and I just and I didn't have like the week off like I still had to like work and like do all the things I needed to do um 
but I just like became determined. And so I woke up at 5 a.m. every single day and I wrote for like two or three hours before work. And then during work, if I could break away for a second, I would like do a little bit more. And then in the evening from like six to midnight, I would work on it more. And I knew it wasn't going to be like this forever, but I was like, I just got to get it done. So those last few days, like I would stay up really late, wake up really early and just worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. The hardest I've ever worked in my life on anything. And that's what a deadline will do to you. You know, like it was nothing like a deadline to really like get you to stop procrastinating. Mm -hmm. And I just worked really hard. And then the night before it was due and they were very clear, like they would not take anything past the deadline of midnight that night it was due and they wouldn't take a half proposal. So meaning they wouldn't take a proposal that didn't have all of the different parts. Mm -hmm. And I, I had so much done of it that it would have been like a big bummer to not submit anything, but I didn't have enough done of it to, submit it. Like I had, I was probably like 98% done, but I had like two big parts that weren't complete. And I was just like, I can't do, I was, it was like 11 PM. I'm working, I'm working, I'm working. And it was like about to be midnight and I didn't have it done. And I was really bummed, but I was like, you know what? Like, there's no way I can get this done. It's, I have like two minutes to go. It's okay. And I just like went to bed and I was like, all right, well, you know what, I'll make a really great ebook and I'll sell it on my website and that'll be cool. And I was like unattached and I went to bed and I, cause I had like woken up at 5am that morning to work and I was just exhausted and like really bummed. And as I was lying in bed, I realized, and I just needed like a little bit more time too, but I just knew I didn't have the time cause it was like 10 to midnight or whatever. And I'm lying in bed and I have a thought Actually, I think it was like washing my face. I was like, wait, Hay House is on West Coast time and I'm on East Coast time. I have three hours. So I manifested more time. I created more time. Nobody can say that you can't create time and move time. So I created three more hours for myself. And in those three hours, I worked so hard and I submitted it with like five minutes to go at like 3 a.m. my time, um, 10 to midnight their time. And... You, we didn't find out for a month, I think, and a month later, I was at a big yoga event on the floor of like the football stadium with my best friend, and my phone didn't work in there. And basically, long story short, I found out that I won. Like on the internet, a bunch of people were texting me. And Hay House has, like, tried to call me, but my phone didn't work in there. So I found out through people texting me because it was on the Internet. But, yeah, I won. I won the first prize, and I got a book deal, and I got to have the book come out, and here I am. Oh, wow. Pretty serious. And how, how yeah, long? Yeah, such a long story. I'm like, <laughs> oh, I hope you just think it's interesting. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. How long ago was that? That was... The very beginning, I submitted it at the very, I was going to say end of 2013, but it was January 2014. So it was the very beginning of 2014. Mm -hmm. um, and the publishing process takes a while. And also I asked for an extra long time to write the book because I'd never written one before and I had a lot going on. So I had about a year to write the book and then after you write the book, you submit it, and then there's lots of editing that happens after that. And then between the final manuscript and it coming out, you have to, like, design the cover and, you know, get your marketing stuff in place and get the book launch ready. So it was a process that really took, you know, two years start to finish. Mm -hmm. okay. it's, it is a long process. And um, I, I had come up with a book idea about five years ago. And um, actually, I was traveling in India, and I met this person who ha actually handed me a journal, and he was a dear friend that I had made there. And he was, he kind of could prophesize things sometimes, and he wouldn't, like, he would just, he just gave this to me. I was like, hey, you're going to write a book one day. I got this for you to start. 
<laughs> I cool. was like, no way. Like, that, I don't believe, you know, how, how is that even possible? Um, and I think at the time when I first got that, I was probably about the same age when, when you were going through this process. And um, it, it's definitely like, it's a process and it scared me in the beginning. And, but then I had all these like synchronicities and stories and things. I was like, I just need to write these down for myself and maybe one day something will come of it. Um, and it's been a big back and forth process of letting it go and coming back. And, but it's actually at a phase now where it's, it's, uh, the manuscript is written and I'm going through the, Yay, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So this coming year is going to be kind of like that, that big push of mm-hmm. learning all the steps and publishing process. And, cool. um, but a piece in your story that is super important that really stands out to me is that, that idea around letting go. And I know that when you submitted that, the proposal, you're like, okay, I'm just, you know, going to be unattached. And I wondered yeah. if you could talk a little bit about that process of just oh, letting go. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was why I told the story which thank you for reminding me. Um, but that was the thing. As soon as I submitted it, I was just like, that's all I wanted to do was submit it. That was my goal. And after that, A, I wasn't in control of what happened. And B, I didn't let it control me. I didn't let my happiness be in something that I couldn't control. You know, I could control me trying to work as hard as I could to get that done and submit it. But then I had to let go and let the universe take over the rest. And that's what I did. I was so, I always use this as an example for myself of a time where I really practiced non-attachment because I so did. I, I lived my life that month and I was like, this is fun and it'll be interesting to see if I win or not, but there's nothing I can do to make myself win anymore. You know, Mm -hmm. I could just to submit the thing, but that's all I could do. So the proposal, I mean. And so in that month, I was just really unattached. And the day it was happening, I wasn't like sitting, waiting by the phone. I was just living my life. And I was like, I'm having an awesome day. And if I win, that will be the icing on the already awesome cake that I am having. It's not the whole cake. And I think that's really important, whether it's a relationship you're trying to manifest, a new career, a book deal, whatever it is holding on and clenching that it has to happen. It has to happen my way will make it not happen. And mm-hmm. it will, or I mean, it's not necessarily that it's just like, you also might get the thing and you'll be like, Oh, all right, this is it. What do I need now? You know? So I think it's all about just like practicing non-attachment and focusing on what you can control, which is how you feel about things and what your thoughts are. And that's about it. Everything else is, is really outside of our control, and, and it's all about just being as present in the moment that you're in and trying to make that moment as great as you can and being grateful for the moment that you're in, even if you're stressed, even if you have a lot to do, even if you're kind of overwhelmed, even if you're behind, whatever, and just know that this is what it is, and tomorrow will be a different moment, and you'll get through that too, and either way, it's going to be okay. Mm. yeah yeah and it's it's really about believing like this is possible for me this is a possibility and like yeah you, like you did you took the actions you did everything you could up to a point and then it's like okay I've done everything now I'm just going to be grateful for what I have and then it's like like you said the icing on the cake it I love that mm-hmm. mm. And there were also these moments that came throughout the process, it sounds like, where it felt like lightning was striking and, and something greater than you was just like coming in and giving you these ideas and being like, no, you can do this. Um, it, can you tell a little bit about those moments that you've had in your life and what you think helps them come on or when they happen, you know, how you yeah. handle them? Yeah, I mean, I think you're talking about like just kind of like intuition hits I guess where like I think one of them was when I got the idea of writing a book about journaling and what it was going to be and it just kind of came through me I get them a lot when I'm writing I think hence why I'm journaling is such an important thing for me I get a lot of intuition and ideas when I'm writing and when I'm 
meditating or when I'm quiet or when I'm doing something mindless, that's usually when I get the ideas. So that's probably, um, you know, that's, that's really the main time I've had experiences like that. But, you know, they can come through other people. They can come through other people's art, I think, um, creativity. But, yeah, just kind of sparks of intuition of, like, a knowing of, oh, this is where I'm meant to be. Or I think I'm meant to go in this direction. Or, you know, this is an idea I should spend some more time on. You just, you just kind of know. Mm-hmm. I find that, too. And it's especially those times when I choose if I'm really in my mind if I choose okay I'm gonna go I'm gonna go exercise I'm gonna get in my body or I'm gonna meditate uh journal those are all ways that the intuition the intuitive side can come out Mm -hmm. and I know that a big part of journaling was around helping change your relationship to your body and develop more love and relationship in that and I wondered if you could speak about that sure yeah um yeah I mean I really struggled with body image growing up and when I was in college it kind of spiraled more because you're in control of your food and your time and your the amount you exercise more when you're not living at home and so it spiraled and kind of went in two different directions gaining a lot of weight and then or some weight and then um losing a lot of weight very quickly um and then into an eating disorder and then healing the eating disorder and learning about body image and learning about weight as a social issue and a feminist issue and and really, you know, kind of getting angry at the way that society puts this pressure on women to look a certain way and demonizes fat, demonizes, like, people being at their normal size that isn't, you know, the size that society and the media deems as beautiful and what the standard of beauty right now includes is thinness and my natural body shape wasn't what I wanted it to be. And that just really upset me. So I used force and I used control to change it to something that it wasn't meant to be. And I could do that for a while and it was okay, but it kind of made me go crazy. It made my relationships not so great. It made my creativity plummet because I used all my willpower, all my discipline, all my decision-making power on controlling my food and eating the perfect clean diet and, you know, doing all these things to my body. So I realized that I was doing that and I wasn't having a life. I didn't have a life other than controlling my food and my body and my exercise. So what I did was I learned to get to know myself beyond my body, besides my body. And that was a process of self-awareness and a process I'm still on it, you know, like I'm still, I still have bad body image days or bad body image moments, but I don't let them turn into a bad body image week. I don't let it take me out. I'm like, oh, I'm feeling like I don't look very good right now. That's okay. That's just a feeling that I'm having and it's not true or maybe it is true, but either way, my worth isn't just in my body and I have worth creatively. I have worth as a person and I'm not going to let it stifle me. I'm not going to let it make me sit and be alone and not be happy because that won't, that'll just make it worse. So journaling was actually a big tool for me to get to know myself and, you know, eventually try to start to like myself for something beyond my physical appearance. So that was the way journaling really helped me with it and still helps, you know, I think it's something about, you know, when you focus on gratitude and you focus on, you know, what's actually happening in your life and 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 not sugarcoating things too I think that the reason journaling is so impactful for me and the reason I recommend it to people is because it is a time when a couple of things first it's one of the few times in our you know fast pacing fast moving society that we have it's one of the few times where it forces us to be completely present it forces us to be 
doing one thing at a time. You know, you can't be journaling and mowing the lawn and listening to a podcast and painting your nails. You know, like you can really just be journaling. You know, you can't multitask with it, which I think is important because there's so few times that you do that. And secondly, it's a time where you can be completely unfiltered. You can be raw, you can be emotional, you can be vulnerable, you can be authentic, you can be real, right? And there's not that many times in our day that we can be completely unfiltered, completely raw and real. And we might have these times with a therapist or a close friend, but I find for me, and this maybe is just me, I find it challenging to open up even with a therapist or even with a close friend because I'm afraid I'll be judged. And at the end of the day, I really want them to like me. So I'm like (laughs) trying to filter a little bit. But with a journal, I could go there. I could say the really negative, dark thoughts I had and no, I wouldn't be judged because it was just for me. And on the, and the same thing, I could say all the light, all the happy goals that I have that I don't think I deserve yet, that I really want, or, you know, I, I, without someone thinking I was boastful or full of myself or it was a pipe dream and shutting it down too quickly, you know, I could go there. I could go to the light. I could go to the dark without judgment because it was just for me. And then when I was able to be that vulnerable with myself, eventually I was able to be that vulnerable or not quite that vulnerable, but I was just able to have more self-awareness for my goals, for my desires, for anything. I was able to bring that to my relationships with other people, to my friendships, to my career, to my creative work, because I first, the first step was to take off the masks to myself. And then I was able to be more comfortable to be able to do that with other people too. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you needed that space to just let it all, like all of it, all the ugly stuff, out. all the great mm-hmm. stuff, yeah, yeah, let it out. And yeah, and I find that for me too, it's like it's a space where, you know, we we sometimes have ulterior motives or something. When we meet a new person, we can't fully like let everything out. And in that journal space, it's it's there for you. No one's going to read it, hopefully. And it's a space where we can just be and then that love that acceptance can come in and that comfort um for ourselves yeah Mm. and i know that you also teach yoga and yoga has been a big part of your path i wonder if you could share about how yoga has fit has fit in in your journey yeah i mean i i taught yoga a lot when i was in college and after college i was like exclusively teaching yoga and blogging and then for many years i just taught once a week but sunday mornings it was my class and i loved it and um actually recently i had to give up that class because i've been traveling so much and it was challenging to find subs on sunday mornings and i i wasn't able to to keep doing that but i love teaching yoga i I love practicing yoga, of course, as well, and and teaching yoga. It's something that's so important to me. And I started doing yoga when I was really young, when I was in high school. And I'm so grateful it came into my life. It it brought me so much. And, um, you know, I think it's another way, much like journaling, where you really have to be with yourself. You really have to, for that hour, that 90 minutes, or that time you're in class and you're on the mat, you have to face yourself you have to it's very uncomfortable for people I think that's why people are resistant to journaling people are resistant to yoga if they haven't started or even if they have a practice with it you know just those days you don't want to go because you just don't want to face yourself you know it's like 90 minutes of like putting that mirror up in your face with your thoughts with your worries with your fears and and with your body and I think it can be uncomfortable but so healing and so important and so beautiful so yeah, I think that journaling and yoga have a lot of parallels, but I'm so glad that I had my yoga practice when I was younger to, again, develop more self-awareness and just have that time with myself. And it's just still something that's really, really important to me. And as far as teaching yoga, I love teaching yoga. Like, I really, really mm-hmm. enjoy it. It's public speaking. It's, you know, it's something that, that I really, really love and, and think is is just a fun thing that I do. So, yeah. Mm. I wish mm. I could do it more. <laughs> I will again someday. Yeah. You teach yoga too? I do teach yoga, yeah. And it's 
just amazing. It was kind of the beginning of of all of the personal growth of just walking into a yeah. yoga class and, like you said, having no distractions. And um, I came to yoga because I was experiencing chronic pain in my body and the doctors mm. were not figuring out what was going on. They're like, well, try this pill or this pill. But at the end of the day, it was so much more just about holding stress and exhaustion in the body and the solution wasn't actually about trying to distract myself from it or numb it out but to just be fully present and there for myself and develop the love for myself that I needed in order to make changes in my life and and that was the the first step coming into yoga practice Mm. Mm, that's amazing yeah um, and I know that, so you, as you've been developing your business and and your gifts and sharing around writing and journaling, your podcast, you talk a little bit about in the book that you also had a full-time job and that you that was something that supported you while you could really give in the places that you were passionate about. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. I think that's, it, it was really, like, reading that, I felt like, wow, that's really, I think that would be really freeing for a lot of people to think, like, we can take our passions and allow them to grow organically, and we don't have to rely on having them our full income right from the get-go. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to hear about your experience with that. Oh, yeah, and I think that you shouldn't have it be your full income, because I think that will sacrifice the work, and... Yeah, I mean, I never wanted to have to put the pressure on my podcast or on my blog or on my book to make me money. And I I shouldn't, let me go back. I used to put the pressure on it to make me money. I was just like, why am I not an entrepreneur yesterday? You know, I see all these people doing it and internet marketing and so many people have blogs and they make money and it's their full-time income. First of all, you don't know if it's, their exclusive income. You don't know if they have a, you know, spouse supporting them or a parent or, you know, maybe they like are independently wealthy. Like you have no idea if their blog is fully supporting them. First of all, (laughs) second of all, they may also have a full-time job and they're just not talking about it because I know for me, I felt like if I am talking about the fact that I have a full-time job, it means that like, I'm not actually an entrepreneur or I'm not actually a creative person like I'm just pretending and so I had a lot of like shame around it and then I read this book called Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert have you read it I have yeah Mm -hmm. so good right and it was many months before the book came out even and she was on a different podcast talking about this book that was coming out and she mentioned the fact that she always wanted to be a writer always was a writer but she had a job all the way up until she'd written books, until Eat, Pray, Love became a huge success. And Eat, Pray, Love was like this massive, massive, massive success. So she had a job up until that because she never wanted to put the pressure on her work to make her money because it would compromise the work. So she did it. And anyway, I just think that that's when I heard that, it really helped me. It really helped me like release any shame I had around my creative work and it not making me money. And I didn't have to put that pressure on it. It was just as real, whether it made me an income or not. And Mm -hmm. that made me so happy and that made me feel so much relief. And yeah. And so I think I just kind of really was able to let go of that. And, And I think that's an important message for everyone to hear. Like, make money however you want to make money and then do your creative work. And, and sometimes those things will merge into one and that's great. And sometimes they won't, but either way is okay. There's no wrong way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's something that I've seen women struggle with is like knowing when, I don't know, to make the shift and, and to think like, okay, I have something on the side that's been going for a while. And, and sometimes there is like, it is a good idea to take a little leap and, and to have go full. Totally. Um, I wonder, I'm curious about you and your experience. Like, are, are you still working in a full-time job? And how have you navigated as you've grown in your offerings with the podcast and writing and all of it? 
Yeah, I still work a full-time job, and I did it throughout my book tour, and I did it through, you know, my podcast, and I have no plans to leave, you know? I, I think someday, maybe, but, like, I love my job, and I'm able to balance it all, and I'm able to, I mean... Right now, I'm like thinking, I'm like, oh man, I have lots to do. But I think that's just like, <laughs> some days I feel like that and some days I don't. You know, I think it's just about, yeah, I mean, I, I, it makes me be very organized. It makes me very mindful of my time. And I do, you know, sometimes wish I was able to focus more on one thing. And I think I would probably have more output if I was. And someday I, I probably will. But Right now, I'm I'm embracing that this is the phase that I'm in, and I think if I wasn't in this situation, I would be much more like, please buy my book, please buy my book right now because I need to pay my rent and I need groceries and I really like Whole Foods and it's so expensive, you know. So I would have to like, I would have that energy with like the selling of my book, and then therefore people would sense that and they'd be like, uh, I don't want that book. Like that is. Like, there's weird energy there. I don't want that. And so, I like, no one would buy it, you know, where now it's like, if you think my book sounds cool, maybe buy it. If not, like, I don't care, you know? Like, mm-hmm. I think you'd like it maybe if you'd like it, but if you're not going to like it, you're not going to like it. Don't buy it. It's fine. Just, like, don't – I. it's not going – I don't need it. I don't need someone to, like, buy my book or be a sponsor of my podcast because if they don't, I'm not okay, Right. Like mm-hmm. if they do, if they do buy it and if they do want to sponsor the podcast, wow, thank you. Like that is so amazing. And that helps me cover the cost of producing these things. And it's helpful and it's beautiful and it's an exchange of energy. But either way, I am going to be able to pay my rent and I'm going to be OK. <laughs> like it doesn't ride on my stuff selling. And I think not having to put that pressure on it is really helpful. And it's not to say, I don't want to say that anyone who did leave their job and is doing something full time is bad either, because I think there's so much, and I'm just talking about this because I don't think my situation is talked about enough. And I think the other situation is there's something so beautiful about leaping and hoping the net appears and leaping and being like, I am leaving my job and I'm going to make it work. And then they hustle and they do just like Anna, I did when I had that deadline, like I think that's kind of a beautiful thing as well. And I think there's no wrong way to do it. Some people have a different threshold for uncertainty. Like for me, my uncertainty threshold isn't that high. So like that would freak me out if I didn't know, you know, where I was going to, if I was going to have enough money to live or like, you know, that would stress me out. And then I wouldn't like have any energy left to, create I wouldn't be able to produce a podcast I wouldn't be able to write I wouldn't be able to make stuff if I was worried about my basic human needs being met like shelter Mm -hmm. and food and money so like for me that didn't work but some people are like oh I'll figure it out it'll be fine people help me it'll be great and they can still create and they make it work and they probably make more stuff than I do but I Mm -hmm. think everybody has a different threshold for uncertainty I've always been more of like a stepping stone person Mm-hmm. And it sounds like it, it does allow you to have more choice of like, what do I want to take on and to be in the gratitude of just like, yeah, I have my basic needs met. And I'm grateful that like, I, I've released this awesome thing. And, and it's if you feel called to get it great. And if not, like that's okay, too. Um it's a powerful place to be in. I mean, I really think both ways are admirable either way, having like knowing that you feel called to do something and actually doing it. And like you said, just being organized and have and knowing that sometimes when you are have more in your schedule, that more things get done. Um, so that was really a cool insight yeah. for me to read about. When yeah. I wrote this down once and I don't remember, um, when this was actually no I do it was when I was in college because I I had this tendency of you know and I think this is just my tendency too. like some like I was saying some people have a different threshold for uncertainty I have a threshold for busyness like I take on I it's it's not like a great quality all the time I have to kind of keep it in check but like I fill up my calendar I take things on I say yes to a lot of things I 
juggle while I like have lots of things going on. I would do it, you know, even when I was in high school and when I was in college for sure, I remember having a time a week where I had so many like exams and papers and tests and like club commitments and friend commitments and stuff happening that week that I was very stressed out. And I remember I like wrote down somewhere or told someone that I was like, you get more done when you're busy. And it's true. Like you get way more done when you're busy. So yeah, I don't know. I think it's, it's about taking care of yourself and not trying to not stress yourself out too much, but knowing, you know, sometimes it's just how it is and Mm -hmm. it ebbs and flows and there's different seasons of life. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. And we all find what works for us and, and that's beautiful. Yeah. And I, I know. And so everything has been growing very organically over the years with your podcast, with the, um, the blog and getting things together. And so I'm curious, like as more people started listening to your podcast and as more people started finding out about you and, and your interviews, um, and sharing your story, like, how do you handle, um, how has it been with like this idea of vulnerability and, more people finding out about who you are and maybe your background or reading your book or like have you had any of those moments like oh my god this is so like too much or has it just felt really easeful I'm curious about that yeah I mean I don't know I think it was like a very gradual process I've been sharing personal stuff about myself online for many years now so I'm pretty used to it I think when I first shared about my eating disorder publicly online, that was like at least two years ago, maybe more now, probably two years ago. Um, that was, that felt big. That felt like, um, a vulnerability hangover type situation where I was like, Oh man, did I share too much? Um, and mostly because of my family and like people who knew me during it when they were like, Oh yeah, told you, you had a new disorder back then, you know, like, um, I think that was kind of the hardest part is the people who I knew seeing that sort of thing. But now, honestly, I'm kind of not, a, not immune to it, but I haven't shared anything that has felt super scary since then recently I know that I'm going to probably share more things but I I wait to share things until I wait to share things publicly or online until I've processed them myself and like I've kind of come to the other side of them Mm. most of the time most of the time I think there's like you know I think that's kind of like a rule like kind of make exceptions for but for the big things I I talk about them a lot with friends close to me and you know people in my life but I don't talk about them or write about them as much and share that until I've moved through it in some way Mm -hmm. I think that's very wise advice yeah to be in a space and not have a charge around it in order to to be able to talk right. about it um, with wisdom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And something that, that helped me, I remember when I first started blogging and I felt, oh, so scary. I don't want to tell about some of the hard things I've been through. And But I, but I knew that like somewhere out there, there, there was someone who needed it. And that when I first started blogging, I remember that really helping me and like having someone come up to me in yoga and be like, oh my God thank you. Thank you for sharing last week. And even though it may have felt scary at the time, having that kind of feedback has made me just feel excited to keep sharing and being honest. And yeah. Yeah, totally. Mm. And I'm also curious if you, how you handle if, if you ever get pushback around, like if someone doesn't like something you share or if, um, maybe someone something someone says on your podcast or how do you go about handling those kinds of situations um you know i've been very fortunate that the type of feedback i've gotten has just been really positive and people have been really nice and my 
I mean, of course, people, like, if they don't like it, I think they're just not sharing with me. I'm sure there's plenty of people who don't like what I'm doing and don't like me, but I don't really see them, and they don't really speak up, knock on wood. Um, (laughs) And, you know, when people give me feedback, I do get feedback, and I listen to it, really. I mean... I, I got some really good feedback on a on a podcast that I put out there this spring that had some content in it that wasn't as body positive and as yeah as I like to be and it was a mistake on my end and it was something that the guests shared and I don't think guests need to, the guests I have on my podcast to share my views one hundred percent of the time I think that would be boring. However, I need to say when I disagree with something, and I didn't in this situation because out of, out of fear and it wasn't the right time to, like, have a discussion with this person who was, like, very set in their ways and, like, they, were, they would not be willing to hear it. Mm. So it wasn't the time. But I was just like, oh, I'll just edit that out. But I forgot, and it was in there. And so then there's a large population of, like, recovered people from eating disorders or people who are recovering And I felt like I kind of let them down and people emailed me about that. And I was like, yeah, you're right. That was a mistake. I was moving too quickly. I should have edited that out. That could have been triggering and I missed it and I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And I came out and I said that and I went back to the episode and I fixed it. And I think we can all move on and be friends and they can be like, good job. You heard us and you fixed it and you made a mistake and everybody can make a mistake. And so I think that's really how I how I handle it. And then other than that, I'm just like really grateful for anyone who's found my book and liked it. And, and, you know, there's in my, in one of my favorite movies, there's this, there's this great line where, um, one of the characters says, talk about what you love and keep quiet about what you don't. And that's what I try to do in the world. And I think that's kind of a great way to be. I I don't think anything productive happens when people get together and talk about how much they hate something Mm -hmm. or how much it bugs them or, you know, whatever. I don't think that's productive. I think getting together and talking about what we love and what we're obsessed with and what we find so fascinating, like that's a conversation I want to be a part of. And that's the conversations I have with my friends. And those are the conversations that I have on my podcast. And that's Mm -hmm. what I am. I'm a curator. I, talk about what I love I find cool stuff and I share it with people so yeah I I don't know if that really answered your question (laughs) absolutely yeah and it's that idea of like yeah if a mistake comes up we can own it and move forward and um and also you what you are putting out in the world this positivity and your authentic love and sharing for what you want to create is that's what sounds like what comes back and that's very much like the law of attraction what you put out comes back yeah yeah Uh, I know I love when you ask on your episode around like morning evening rituals and I thought I would ask you just what are your current rituals around what how you things you do when you wake up in the morning or what you've been doing lately before you go to bed yeah for sure so well you know it changes with the seasons for me for sure um but right now lately I I wake up and I drink a bunch of water and I try to make my first thoughts something positive something grateful something excited about the day and I actually I go to the bathroom first I go to the bathroom and then I drink a bunch of water (laughs) and like brush my teeth and scrape my tongue I'm getting very like specific and granular here but those are like the literal first few things and then after that I um lately I like to get outside right away and I'll just like put on some like shorts and like go on a walk and like listen to something maybe and just like get some sun and fresh air and then I'll come back and do my meditation. I do TM meditation so I do 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening and I might switch that. I might like meditate first and then go on the walk but I always um, meditate. Sometimes I walk, sometimes I don't and if I don't do the walk I'll usually go to like a bar class or Pilates class or yoga class or something and I do that more in the winter but in the summer I don't really as much I'll just kind of 
do a walk and get into my day. And yeah, and that's basically it. I'll, I like eating breakfast. It's like my favorite meal. So I'll eat something and kind of get into work. And then in the evening, it's different every day depending on what I'm doing. But I usually finish work and I try to like plan what I have to do the next day, the day of, because that really helps me be less overwhelmed the next day. And if I don't remember to do that, I'll kind of go into the next day like, oh, where should I go? What do I do? I don't know. Because I, I work from home and I just like, there's so many options and choices. And so I try to plan the, the day before. Um, and then I will stop working and I'll meditate to kind of like book into my day. And then I will, you know, sometimes I'll go to, again, to a, if I didn't in the morning, I'll go to a Pilates class or yoga class or something, or I'll go on another walk. Um, a lot of times, honestly, I, I don't do that and I'll record a podcast in the evening. That's when I usually record my podcast, um, or like we're doing right now and I'll be on someone else's. And then after that, I usually just have dinner and like watch you know, YouTube videos or something. And that's kind of like my reality TV or I'll watch a movie. I'm trying to watch more movies because it really is good for me. Or I'll go out to dinner with friends or I'll go see a movie with friends. Um, and then I get ready for bed. I always wash my face and brush my teeth. I can't go to sleep without doing that. And then I, I don't really read in bed. I can't do that. I just like get too tired and uncomfortable so sometimes I'll like listen to a podcast or an audiobook a little bit before bed something positive and then I have a little journal by my bed and I write down 10 things that I'm grateful for that day and I try to make it different every day and then I write mm -hmm. down three things I'm excited about doing the next day so it helps me to get out of bed and then I write down three things that went well that day and sometimes mm -hmm. it's really easy. Sometimes I'm coming up with like 12 and sometimes it's hard for me to get through two and I like push myself, but I always find them and I always do it. And then I go to bed. Yeah, that's really it. Mm. I, I'm just writing down those last pieces of what you write in your journal. That's really helpful. I think just ending the day with gratitude and thinking about what you're excited about the next day and what went well. Um, one of my favorite exercises from the book was that the idea of the excitement plan and like if you have trouble waking up early in the morning or getting out of bed like we should be excited about our day so what can you do to bring in to morning to just have like a little ritual with yourself mm -hmm. so, that's super helpful thank you yeah uh, so a question that I ask everyone who comes on this show I, I'm really curious about how people um, navigate when fear comes up in their life and I would love to hear if like there is a fear that has come up for you in the last year like what that was and how you overcame it um, I'd love to hear about that oh that's a great question hmm I've had a lot of fears um, I think a, a big one is like taking chances and putting myself out there into situations that are uncomfortable and I don't know if they'll pay off, but they're worth a try, even though the outcome is uncertain. And so, like I was saying before, I have like a low threshold for uncertainty and me like trying to push beyond that and go to things that I don't necessarily want to go to in the moment, but I think will be good for me or like going on a date that I'm not sure I'm going to like the person, but trying it because I know it's good for me, you know, like kind of pushing myself to do things that the outcome is uncertain, you know, with a job, with a traveling thing, you know, just really pushing myself outside of my comfort zone. I hope that wasn't too broad of an answer, but literally I could share a million little fears I've had this year and how I've just been like, yep, I'm afraid, but I'm going to do it anyway. And honestly, sometimes being like, yeah, I should have been afraid. That was hard. Or sometimes being like, wow, that was really hard, but I'm really glad I did it. Mm. Yeah. I think that's a good skill to have to notice when we have 
the discomfort come up and be like, okay, what's that about? Maybe I could be with that edge a little bit more. Um, Can you think of an example of when you did one of those things and it turned out really awesome and you felt super proud of yourself? (laughs) Yeah. um, I I booked a trip to Hawaii. Um, this year and I haven't actually gone on the trip yet, but yeah, I mean, I think I was a little bit scared of like, Oh, should I, do I have the time to go on this? Like, cause I'm going to be gone for a while and it's kind of it's like during the holidays of this year. And I didn't, I don't, and I still don't know, I guess this is kind of like an undone answer, but it hasn't happened yet. So I don't know what it's going to be like. I could hate it. I could love it. I could you know, have been going completely by myself and mm-hmm. I've never like traveled that far by myself and just been really uncertain of all of it. Um, but everything worked out so well with it. Like the time that I'm going to be gone worked out perfectly. My, I was able to like use airline miles on it. I was able, because of all the travel for my book tour, I was able to, you know, have like you know, the, just all of it worked out so perfectly that I just know it's where I'm meant to be. And I'm so excited for it. And I so need it after the year that I've had, it's been a really great year, but it's just been a really like outward year that I'm really excited to like go to something for me. So that's an example of like my fear was like, don't do it. You stay home. You don't have the time. You don't have the money, like save your money, do something else. You should, the terrible timing, like all of these things. But I was like, cool but I'm gonna do this anyway yeah oh that's one of my favorite ways to be in the unknown is actually traveling and just like I, I've actually traveled quite a bit on my own and I'm really excited for you <laughs> what's gonna happen because there's so hey. much there's so much magic when you just like okay I have my plane ticket I'm going yeah. to listen to my intuition and see what happens and yeah I hope that yeah. it just the magic really meets you there. I think it will. (laughs) Thank you so much. This has been so much fun. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, my last question, I'm just curious if there's anything that you're excited about in your business or your life, anything you'd love to share about. Um, Of course, I, I'm going to put links to the book on the the show notes so people can look into that, but anything else you want to share what you're, what's going on for you? Yeah, I mean, of course I'm excited about the book and I I love the book and I would love for people to check it out. But I think what's really, really exciting to me right now is my podcast. I love it so much. I love the conversations I get to have. I love the people listening and getting to have conversations with them like we're doing now. Um, I love the guests that I've had on. I love everything about it. So my podcast is what I'm most excited about in my life right now. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Check that out. It's called Let It Out with me, Katie Dalebow, and it's on iTunes and everywhere you listen to podcasts. So, yeah, check it out. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Well, I'm so grateful yeah. for having the space to share and hear a little bit more about your life yeah, today. Thank you. This is great. Um, Have yeah. an amazing rest of your night and weekend. Thank you. And I'm just going to close the call with... Um, just another little meditation. See if we can just yeah. tune back into the breath. And whoever's listening, I invite you to just connect back to that space within. To tune into any insights that you may have had hearing Katie's stories. Anything that you may want to implement into your life. And bring that gem into your heart. And then I'll just bring my hands together and bow with gratitude. Thank you, Katie. Thank you to everyone listening. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you.